ADLC. Those are the three uh, three commands uh, uh, used from anywhere in the uh, four networks to get there. So, so what do we use these networks for? We use them to uh, not just to reach the state EOC. That should not be a, as a network uh, IT tech in your county or in your district. You want to tie all the resources together in your district. Your hospitals, your NGOs, your Red Crosses, um, your fire departments, whatever it may be. You want to get all of that stuff talking. And if you can your NGO, get it right across the history, you want to um, your fire departments, whatever it may be, you want to get all of that stuff talking. And if you can your NGO, other counties who have built up across the history, you want to your fire departments, whatever it may be, you want to get all of that state EOC. No. If the only thing you can reach is your neighboring county stuff talking, and if you can your NGO, other counties, that'll work. But the goal should be build out a network that services your local uh, infrastructure. Because where do most emergencies go? The goal should be build out a network that services your local uh, all of the infrastructure. Because where do most emergencies go? The goal should be build out a network that services your local uh, all of the infrastructure. Because where do most emergencies go? The goal should be build out a network that services your local uh, the message across. Uh, you can move traffic. Uh, out of the very busy EOCs. How many folks have worked inside an EOC during a drill or an event? Wow, a lot of you. And was it mayhem in there? And you had limited radio bandwidth, or you had limited manpower, or it was noisy. There are lots of things go on inside an EOC, and the last thing you need to be working on is trying to figure out a route somewhere, or figure out where, where something needs to go. One of the jobs of, uh, of managing the, uh, an event is knowing when and where you should offload some responsibility to someone else. So being able to go and take some traffic that you need to get delivered somewhere, take yourself out of that loop, move it off to a key station. It could be across town, it could be in the next building, it could be set up in the parking lot with a mobile uh, uh, packet station. You can move the message off to the guy and let him work on it and free you up to do things that need to happen inside the EOC. I've seen this happen where messages are written onto a flash drive or just scribbled out on paper and you get and you do sneaker net. Everyone familiar with the term sneaker net? You know, run, you, you know, you run somebody out to the car or an office or a building and they, they run it across and give it to the radio operator they take care of getting it injected into the system and off it goes. So some of the some of the stuff you might end up sending during emergencies, of course, are various resource lists, um, uh, personnel uh, login information, uh, and uh, like you might have, uh, we've got the following stations uh, checked in with the following resources available. So when you're looking for who can I go and send that can handle uh, making sure an important uh, uh, pump keeps running in a flood situation or bring certain supplies to a certain location. You've got, uh, you've got your data, so, so holding or passing this via the packet network can be a good way of getting data out from your net control station out in the field into the EOC so they're aware of what resources are available to get a job done. Equipment and personnel availability, same sort of thing. Uh, many people go and set up an SQL database on their packet networks so that when they need to go in and get information about, uh, uh, I don't know, what shelters are currently open, they might drop into a database, pull all the data of what shelters are open. I'm making stuff up as I go because the scenario is going to be different depending on what event or exercise you're dealing with. Status reports, one of the ones that I always like doing is when we open up uh, Red Cross shelters, the shelter manager needs to send a daily report back to the chapter. He or she fills that report out. We send it over the packet network direct to the chapter. We don't have to go and put somebody in a car to take a piece of paper across town or across a county. So the packet network saves you a lot of, uh, a lot of driving back and forth. You get data 
to its uh, designation quicker. PIO announcements. Ralph, a PIO. Yay, Ralph. I'm not. Oh, you're a POC. PIC. PIC. Yeah, kind of same difference. But anyway, um, during, during drills and emergencies, we as operators are not supposed to be talking to the press. Is that correct? Yeah. So, who do we send them to? The PIO or the PIC? The information officer. The person who is supposed to give the press the official word that's been uh, cleansed sufficiently not to embarrass the department, the county, the organization. So, if the press approach you and, gee, the PIO or the PIC has already sent out an official announcement as to what's going on, now I've got a piece of paper I can hand to the press and say, oh, hey, read this. This is the official word. So the packet network can be used for something like that. Obviously, weather reports and conditions, um, images and maps. We used to have a, uh, John McDonough ran a, uh, uh, some scripts at his place in Midland. He would grab the NWS uh, weather radar. He would neck it down with some image processing software and so that it wasn't too awful big, a K or two in size. Put that up on a web server and through the 1200 baud packet radio network, we were able to pull down weather maps during you know, uh, a whole roll of, uh, or a whole bunch of thunderstorms going rolling across the state. We can see where they're all at. Does that work real well? The Michigan Ampernet, this is circa last month. Um, we didn't have a big rollout of, of new uh, ham gates. But we had a lot of nodes get rolled out down in Region 2 South, uh, Washtenaw, Monroe, uh, Wayne County area, some in Livingston. I don't have docks for everything because it just got too cluttery, but uh, there was a good rollout of getting stations equipped and trained. That was my goal this year, was not to push towards getting more nodes up, but mostly to, where there were nodes, get more users up and running. Because a node sitting somewhere that has no users is worth what? Electricity consumed? <laughs> Whatever. But we ended up with a lot of, node, a lot of uh, growth in, uh, in District 2 South. I know I don't have all the little brown dots for the BPQ nodes, uh, but uh, Jeff and, uh, and uh, uh, I want to say Sean, that's not it. Um, same, no, further west. Uh, Shane. Shane, thank you. <laughs> Bad with names. Uh, apparently, he's got uh, quite a number of people down there in the uh, St. Joe County area. Uh, we'd like to get more up in uh, Kalamazoo, but uh, uh, they did. Good, good. Okay. So send me that info. This, this map I threw together really, really quick because I realized I didn't have any time to put everything in, so I put in a few. Um, there's been good growth up along the uh, west coastline of, uh, of BPQ nodes, certainly a lot more in, uh, in Kent County and surrounding areas. Rick Mark, you're here somewhere? There you are. Rick has a bunch going on up in, uh, in Mass Speed, up in uh, District uh, 7. Yeah. So he's got a bunch there. And then over on the east side of the state around Alcona, Alpena, which has been online forever, but down in Iosco County, Tallis, he's uh, up and running. And uh, Jim reported that he's probably got a dozen or so people running BBQ in, in his region. So things are growing. Is Mike from Antrim County here? No, nope, he's question, not. Question, Jay, what's the blue dot in Bay County? Green. Oh, the green dot in Bay County? I think that was something I didn't uh, take off. It used to be used to be one of the proposed sites for a ham gate in Bay County, and I just didn't. I, I missed that when I was coloring up the map. Right. There was a key emphasis about there. That's true. Yeah. So we'll get to it later, but we are trying to collect um, mapping information, just where are things, and Tom. Uh, we'll, we'll have a link to your uh, website or to your uh, spreadsheet, but Tom uh, uh, KTV is doing a great job at 
providing a resource where he can send information in, get it all onto onto a spreadsheet, and then he makes that available. Are you going to make that available like monthly? Or really? It'll be updated monthly. Be updated monthly. Sounds often enough. <laughs> um, the Ambernet nodes, uh, you can connect to them with plain old AX25 from a TNC. They also talk BPQ, so you can link to them with BPQ if you're so running. Um, you can link to them with a KNET node, which is uh, the uh, KNET function in a KBC3 Plus with the right firmware. Um, they link together with one another uh, via internet as well as over the NetROM network. We also link across the top of the NetROM network using a thing called IPNR. That's running I TCP IP over the top of an existing NetROM network. So as long as two nodes can reach, reach one another via NetROM, the JNOS nodes can then go and pass TCP IP over the top of that as if it was just data. Because that's all it really is, bits, zeros and ones. So we pass IP over the top of NetROM. And that has worked out well, and that actually is how we get into the state EOC, is via a NetROM link between Eaton and, uh, and SEOC. Uh, Michigan is uh, in the Ambernet network is busted up into 44.102 uh, address space and uh, we reserve a number of uh, I'll say slash 24 CIDR blocks in each county so you can have multiple subnets um, and of course the TCP IP protocol can carry the entire suite of protocols used on the internet including SSL protocols, so SSH, and, you know, secure FTP, and things like that, except why don't we use SSL protocols in amateur radio? We can't. It's encrypted and not allowed. BPQ network, MI7 BPQ network. Uh, the purpose was to reach the uh, CMEN operated Winlink uh, uh, RMS uh, 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 post office server. And I'm going to ask the question again of uh, Fred. You're currently running five POS servers, is that correct? There's five Winlink RMS servers all linked on the, on the microwave. Those RMSs would store the net mail so that you don't have to, the mail doesn't go and leave the state or the, our network, it stays there. Stays there so you don't have to go out on the internet. It doesn't go out the internet. Yeah, that is an awesome solution. I like that. And last time I counted the number of nodes, I think it was up around 17. More than that, I think, but I can't. There's too many to count now. Yeah. Run out of fingers after 10. The, uh, uh, each of the nodes carries a, a multiple names. There's names like you see here in the slide, like MI7 Phil uh, would also have another NetROM node name that take you strict, uh, directly into the RMS server. It'll also have an, an, uh, a NetROM node name takes you right into the chat server and so forth. So when you go and see the route table list on MI7, there'll be a lot of nodes listed, but they'll each go by you know, three or four uh, names each. Each of the nodes typically offers a two meter and a 70 centimeter user access port at 1200 baud. The, uh, since they're co-located at MI6 nodes, they have 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz user access. Again, using a MicroTik node, configured according to the, uh, to the script that uh, Fred provided on his website. Um, and is it uh, roughly about 10 miles is a, is a good range on, typically? Typically. But uh, microwave's a quirky thing. It, it doesn't talk through trees very well. It doesn't bounce off buildings and handle multipath very well. So this is the kind of thing where you want to get your, end, your, your microwave antenna and probably the node with it up above the treetops or put them on building roofs. Great way to go. And of course the, uh, the microwave, the MI6 nodes will uh, give you a DHCP lease in the 44.103 address space. Alrighty. So, some, this was a map that John McDonald put together uh, a while back. I think it's about a year old now, John, or a little bit less. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a consolidated map of the various known nodes and, uh, and uh, uh, whether they be uh, 
JDOS nodes, home stations, digipeters, et cetera, and then they're labeled, they're uh, categorized by, uh, by the color of the balloon. Um, has that been updated recently, John? No, it hasn't. Has not. But the iron's in the fire, and you'll get to it any month now. Yeah, there's only two or three hundred things left. It, I, I suspect what will end up happening, John, is we'll all mount the rush to go and burden Tom, uh, KTB, with all of the information. Tom's uh, spreadsheet will end up being the, the uh, basis of which you write some really cool, fancy shell script or bash script to go and generate all those dots. Sound like a plan? I think it would be cool if you use the <laughs> Yeah, let like, well, the state put it together. They, you can hang the frequencies and all that stuff on a, on a tag on the, on the GIS. Exactly. So uh, the links to all these maps and whatnot are on the uh, mi-drg.org website. Interoperability. Isn't that the, the, the conference we're at is about interoperability? These, uh, these four networks uh, do interoperate uh, pretty well with one another. Interoperability, the ability to foster collaboration with open, interoperable protocols that work just fine across organizational boundaries. We have four different networks run by three different organizations. If you can call one of the organizations being a bunch of guys that run things on their own as an organization, but I think that's fair to say, because they do a good job of it. But we have four distinct networks using two protocols, TCP IP or NetRom. So the decision of what backbone protocol you want to run narrowed down to, to just two. Uh, the goal is, is to not create walled gardens. Everyone familiar with the term walled gardens? Um, right now, I kind of consider the Midland Bay, Saginaw area as somewhat of a walled garden in that we can't seem to reach it via BPQ or, or NetROM or TCP IP and they've got a perfectly good ham gate sitting in there that if we can just update it to support NetROM and get it into the NCAP route tables, 35 or 40 users in, that, uh, in, the, in the Thumb Bay area will be able to show up on all of our network maps and be reachable. So uh, we got to work on mod. <laughs> um, the Ampernet, the BPQ net, uh, the MI7 BPQ, and the MI6 networks play well, as I said, because of two common uh, protocols. However, we're still faced with a, with a problem, and I think we can get over it. Uh, MI7 only accepts NetROM uh, routes or uh, host names listed in the route table if you are directly connected to them. So if you've got an MI7 node, and you're close enough to it, you will get listed in their, in their route table. If you have 10 stations that connect with you and they're in your route table, those will not be shared into the MI7. So, like nodes in Monroe County are not directly connected, but I'm directly connected, so all of Monroe County cannot reach anything inside MI7 or any networks beyond. And hopefully we can get over that, uh, uh, that political uh, speed bump and uh, convince the seamen uh, guys to open up their route tables to getting, yeah, they're going to get big, they're going to be 100, 150 nodes perhaps, but it would open it up where all of us can pass traffic more, uh, more evenly and uh, fairly. The user interfaces that you as uh, users sitting in front of the packet station might see, first, Real simple, dumb terminal, keyboard to keyboard kind of stuff. You get a command prompt from, <coughs> from your uh, TNC or, or your BPQ node. On a JNOS node you, uh, or BPQ nodes, you can get this alphabet soup prompt. We lovingly call it alphabet soup because it's just a string of letters, each letter standing for a command. C for connect, T for telnet, uh, D to download, U for upload. Um, and on an end for listing the uh, NetROM uh, node list, and so forth. There are lots of commands available. Both of the, uh, both BPQ and, and JNOS have very, very similar alphabet soup prompts, except in BPQ it's shorter. There are fewer commands, so they spell them out as words. 
Um, outpost, as I covered earlier, awesome uh, 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 mail client program that you can run on your PC, uh, allowing you to, to allowing Outlook, or I'm sorry, Outpost to talk to your TNC, handle all of those commands you don't want to learn, and it takes care of connecting to the network and getting to where you want to go. Looks like mail. But it also has a dumb terminal mode built in. And that's good because sometimes the automated stuff breaks, right? <laughs> we always have something break. So having the dumb terminal mode lets you get in and poke at what went wrong and correct it. Might just be a setting somewhere. Uh, might be a feature that's not supported. We covered FL message and, F, uh, and uh, FLDG earlier. It's really meant for uh, HF use. Though we did do an SET a couple of years back where we had everybody go and send, uh, send some ICS forms uh, via uh, uh, the FL packages by putting the data in, it does it in the right format, and then it spits it out more kind of like a flash report. You cut and pasted that in and sent it on. It, uh, it worked mostly, but it was very uh, uh, time consuming and it took a high degree of training to get people used to what it was they needed to do. I think we learned a lot from that exercise and not do that again. Uh, airmail, really, really easy. Um, or if you happen to be using um, a Linux box, John uh, RCR put me onto Pat down here in the lower right corner. Pat is an awesome, super simple WinLink client for Linux. Really easy to install, really easy to configure, and super easy to use. Um, and you can you can use Pat to just connect over the internet to go to WinLink and grab stuff without using your radio. You can have it use your TNC and go do it, or you can uh, have it go and log into a BPQ or a JDOS node and use the uh, WinLink RMS feature of those to get to WinLink. So lots of user interface choices there when you're considering how to build out a network. Here's the alphabet soup prompt for a BPQ node. When you log in, it assumes your login is the call sign you came from. Uh, I don't think there's a way to change that, but you end up with commands that are spelled out as words, RMS, chat, connect, buy. Over on the far end is when you connect up to a uh, JDOS node. Um, it doesn't know who you are and gives you the option of typing in a, a login and a password. And typically it's just your call sign followed by, for password, just your first name. You can go and tighten up security and Mako Langelier is actually making some changes to JNOS right now where it will use MD5 to go and authenticate who you are when you log in. Um, <coughs> it tells you how many messages you might have in your mailbox and then the alphabet soup prompt is spelled out as a bunch of letters. And you'll notice chat and SEOC. <coughs> chat will take you to the chat server, at least on my note, takes me to the chat server at Eaton. And uh, SEOC does just that. It telnets me to the SEOC. You can add aliases to, uh, I think either of those packages will allow you to add aliases. Outpost, this is what it looks like. It's a mail client, super simple. It supports uh, custom forms, which is good for Michigan because Michigan uses custom forms. Uh, as I said, it does support a, uh, a dumb terminal mode, which is uh, real handy when you need to go and troubleshoot. And uh, Outpost will run under uh, Linux if you run it under uh, if you run it under Wine or on top of Wine. Okay, FL message. We already beat that into the ground. There is not a drop down for packet. Or AX25. It's meant for the uh, FL Digi modes um, for HF use. Airmail, this is a WinLink Airmail. Again, real clean user interface, gives you a lot of options. Also supports custom uh, ICS forms, so that works real well. 
interfacing with my sins inside of an EOC. We had a number of hands go up from people who said, yes, we've operated inside an EOC, and hopefully all of you will be invited back because you behave yourself and show that uh, you could do the job. Uh, but inside an EOC, oftentimes you need to take stuff out of my sins, send it out on a packet, or vice versa, which is more common. Um, so it's good that you run your web browser that you log into my sims with on the same machine that, uh, that is providing your, uh, uh, your packet interface or your packet window so that you can cut and paste between them on the same glass. Uh, this was a problem at the State EOC because the Dell computer got way, 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 way too old, I guess, or something. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. But got to the point where the browser was too old to run my sims. And that kind of crippled us for a little bit. But I got the disk. I'm going to the State EOC, upgrading that, uh, that Dell computer, bring it up to date, and, uh, and fix the uh, receive audio problem on the, on the uh, JNOS node. So we'll be back on that. And I heard the cheers coming out of the front row from, from Jeff. Uh, there is no direct link between uh, Packet and MySims, and I don't know that there really ever will be because that would be involved some intense security on the part of the IT team that uh, uh, writes and supports uh, MySims. And I don't know that they'll invest the man hours in, do in doing that for us, but uh, it would be nice if you could directly drop things into MySims. Um, and as I said, I'll be going up to the State EOC to make uh, improvements on the, uh, on the uh, packet computer. So what's new? We covered, we did, did the review, brought everybody up to date here, so what's new? Besides the addition of more nodes, both the BPQ side, the MI7 side, the, uh, uh, and the uh, JNOS side, besides having more trained and equipped operators to draw upon, that's always good, having a network without users, and so uh, there has been more interest in doing some short uh, hop inter-county or cross-county uh, or intra-county uh, uh, microwave links. Uh, various methods have been used, Microtik, Ubiquity, and, uh, and a new thing, NPR, which we'll cover in a bit. Uh, those of you that sat in this room and heard me multiple times ask the, uh, the rep from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, FirstNet, to not take away the 3.4 gigahertz band. Um, I've spoken with three different reps from two different companies about that, and each one of them wrote down the information and said, we'll check on it. So though we have an NPRM uh, 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 with the FCC to go in uh, where they, they want uh, response about whether we should or should not get rid of the 3.4 gigahertz band, we. Uh, uh, it can't hurt to go and have people on the inside say, hey, we need this. The uh, ARDC, uh, the Amateur Radio Digital Comms uh, group, which maintains the 44 stroke 8 address space, um, recently sold off one quarter of that space. IPv4 has value. And as long as it's got valid, that's not going to last forever as IPv6 protocols get deployed more and more and more. So while IPv4 still had value, the ARDC sold off one quarter of the space for in excess of $50.50 million. This set up a grant program uh, where they can uh, give out funds to pet projects that are uh, amateur radio, uh, data, and packet related. Um, we had the, uh, the DCC presentation by ARRL and Tapper in Romulus uh, recently, and there were probably 20 people that were in that room that otherwise would not have made it if it wasn't for grant money from this uh, program that paid for their air flights, paid for the rooms, and so forth, to get them in the room so we could learn about cool projects they were working on. <laughs> um, I've been working on a, uh, I've been working with a, uh, a uh, IP tables whiz about cleaning up the firewall rules on the handgate nodes. We still end up being fully exposed to the internet. They get attacked a lot. So we're uh, cleaning up the firewalls on that. Um, I got approached by uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, section staff in Puerto Rico 
They're really interested in deploying a JNOS network on the island. Um, they'll link it mostly using things like NPR radios and microwave uh, uh, units because they've got a lot of mountains out there and that really helps. So then uh, they're chatting back and forth with them about what they can do. I did a similar uh, uh, consulting job with, um, uh, with Michael Fox out in California. Not Michael J. Fox, the actor, but Mike Fox, I think he's uh, WAMEF. He, uh, uh, he built an awesome JNOS based TCP IP network in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's all based on 70 centimeter high speed uh, radio links between the sites, because microwave in an earthquake zone doesn't work so well. Antennas get uh, shaken around and don't point where they're supposed to, and during an emergency, you don't want to be sending crews out to fix stuff. So we're working with Puerto Rico, uh, mostly just email at this point. We haven't gotten to chatting on the phone. The SEC, our SEOC node repairs are uh, in, in process. I'll be calling you soon. Uh, problems still persist with the NetROM route table between a couple of the networks. But, but, new packet radio. Who has heard of new packet radio, NPR? All right. 70 centimeter. RF Ethernet modems are now available. But before we get to that, uh, more node uh, or more uh, online maps are available. Uh, www.midrg.org, maps.html. And uh, Tom and uh, KTB is maintaining the, uh, uh, his uh, node list as a spreadsheet. And uh, there's the URL to that. We'll put that up on, I don't currently have that on the DRG website, but I'll add that when you get back home. Okay. Can yes. I just interrupt for one second? Uh, there is another session that has started at the main break room. We do have a little bit more time in here because there's nothing right up after. Yep. I just wanted to point that out in case anybody wanted to hit that one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, back in September, Tapper invited me to be a guest presenter at the uh, AWRL uh, Tapper DCC Digital Communications Conference in Romulus. I told the uh, peanut gallery about our four networks, what we're doing. Um, uh, one of the, the slide that's up here on the screen uh, kind of was kind of fun because uh, it uh, just says packet question mark. Isn't that what Tapper used to do? Anybody see any packet equipment coming out of Tapper in the last 15 years? Yeah, they don't do that anymore. But that was the, uh, that's the most recent uh, uh, presentation I've done for DCC in a long time. The last one I did was 32 years ago at DCC number six. It's been a while. Um, <coughs> Tapper also wanted to do a, a presentation on new packet radio, but we didn't have anything in hand to really get up to speed and, and know what we were doing, so uh, I could not uh, jump on board there. Uh, they tried other avenues that, uh, that uh, uh, didn't uh, come to fruition. The full YouTube of the presentation I did is available on YouTube. You can, uh, you can just Google for um, my call sign, uh, d.c.c. Uh, uh, look for YouTube, my call, DCC, and you'll probably find it. It was kind of fun. Nice group. So we've talked about the different protocols. What is it that they run on? Hey, they run very nicely on a Raspberry Pi. Who here cannot afford a Raspberry Pi? Well, no, I won't ask that. <laughs> Who thinks a Raspberry Pi can be afforded by everyone? Is that a more politically correct way to say it? <laughs> Raspberry Pis are pretty cheap, you know, 35, 40 bucks, easy. <clears throat> and it doesn't take a real powerful one to run Packet or BPQ or, or uh, JNOS. Uh, the old Pi B or, uh, was, was available. The ones with the RCA phono jack on them, that was plenty enough to go around a packet station on. Uh, three or three plus uh, is better. Four, and yeah, might require some heat sink. Anyway, but both Lin BPQ and JNOS run on those. And uh, so I've got it in my bag over here. I've got 10 copies. Well, I'll cover that in a moment. Yeah, I got ahead of myself. So, uh, Coastal Chipworks, who makes the uh, the Tink Pi, uh, it's the uh, it's a Kiss TNC that just sits right on top of the uh, 
the Raspberry Pi. I've got one right here, got another one here in this box. Uh, super easy. If you're running just a single Tank Pi, single radio channel, you can use the uh, serial, uh, serial interface, Dev AMA0, will get you uh, to the uh, Raspberry Pi. They are hard coded at 192, so don't try other baud rates. 192 is all the Tink Pi does. However, if you're going to make a stack for multiple radio ports, the uh, Tink Pi can be configured to use the I squared C bus, where you give each one of them, like they've got the master at 08 and uh, the first tank at 06, 04, 02. Give them each their own individual addresses, and the instructions on the Coastal Chipworks website tell you how to do that. However, Coastal Chipworks is going out of business. They've already sold out of all of their uh, tank pies, so now what do we do? Well, turns out our buddies over at, uh, at uh, MFJ are planning on picking that up and selling it as, a, as one of their products. But if you look at MFJ's pricing on what Coastal Chipworks used to sell for 40 bucks, I'm going to guess this thing's probably going to be $80. That's a little stifling, but if you got to do it. Uh, the Seaman Group has a image available. Uh, Mike uh, <coughs> Wolthius, is that how you say it? Yeah, Mike Wolthius has put out an a image of a Raspberry Pi with BPQ already installed. I did the same on uh, uh, noobs for the, Rasp uh, for the Raspberry Pi with JNOS already compiled, installed, the directories in place, the config files are all in place. It can be reconfigured and you have to reconfigure it because I've got it set up as W1AW. I've learned from putting out images in the past, if I put my own call sign in as an example, people come up and operate under my call sign. So I made it W1AW. More people might be a little bit more better influenced to go and edit the config files before putting a radio on it. Funny story, one of our guys in Ann Arbor did just that. Brought it up, had a radio, and Dale Williams calls me up on the phone and he says, hey, how did W1AW end up on our packet network? I just heard him in my, J in my just heard list. And I had to explain to Dale, no, 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 they're really not getting all the way in from Newington. It was one of our guys in, uh, in town who was just uh, firing up the test image. Where, where do you get this? You get that from me. Um, I don't currently have it online, but I have 10 copies of the, uh, of the micro SD. It's a 32 gig uh, SD, not the one that I have pictured. That was just a cool picture. Um, I've got 10 copies of it here, and I'm just selling it for the, for the cost of the media, which is about four bucks. If anyone throws me extra cash, I'll roll that over into buying more micro SD cards and, and passing them out. So I'll mark you down for one. Is that, you want one too? Uh, our, yeah, our I do, I'm also interested if it's configured uh, for the B+. It'll, it'll work on the B+. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I tried it in a, uh, in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, in just a, a, like what was pictured here, you know, with, with just the, uh, the Pi B, and it worked. And I tried it in the Pi 3, and it worked, and the 3B, and it worked. And a friend put one in a Pi 4, and it worked. So it, it worked across the entire fleet, apparently. Have not tried it on a zero. I don't think a zero has quite got what we need. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, uh, it does auto start using, for those Linux sysadmin folks, it does auto start at boot time using system B. And I put some menus in under the Raspberry Pi pull down menu to start and stop the uh, JNOS application. Uh, so sometimes you need to do that. Oh, I need to stop my station. Something's gone wrong or I configured something wrong. You can stop it, edit something, re you know, reconfig, start it back up. And the RF nodes are staying up for in excess of 100 days. Um, the only ones that have gone down is because of a power failure. Uh, so it's nice and stable. So, new packet radio. You've all been staring at the blinking light. Every presentation have, should have lots of uh, blinking light. Blinking light is good. 
Um, these are full duplex, uh, in this case, 56K RF modems. They take an Ethernet, put it out on the air, scoot it across at 56K, pick it up on the other end, drop it back onto an Ethernet. They, uh, they uh, look like they're operating full duplex because just like DMR, they're transmitting for about 60 milliseconds, receiving for 60, transmit for 60, receive for 60. They, they time slot like that. Um, they get configured, I'll, I'll cover in a moment, they do get configured as a master and many slaves or clients. They are using off-the-shelf <laughs> components, which keeps the price down. All the components in here are things that you can you can pick up a, a catalog and, and buy. Um, you can get the board artwork and print your own circuit boards. However, our, our friends at Funtronics uh, sell it in a nice metal case like this for uh, uh, 70 bucks, $80 built. How many here would never ever attempt to do surface mount uh, components, soldering them in? Yeah, the eyes, the fingers. There's a point in life where you say, yeah, for 10 bucks, I ain't doing that. So I bought mine pre-built. Uh, they are capable of 200 kilobits per second. However, we live in the United States and the FCC says we have a symbol rate limit to limit our bandwidth occupied. And everyone remembers their Nyquist, two times the symbol rate gives you your bandwidth. Uh, so uh, we're limited to about 56K to fit inside a 100 kilohertz wide channel. As it happens, a long, long time ago, the Mis Michigan Area Repeater Council set aside five 100 kilohertz channels uh, for use in Michigan. But be careful. These channels are also shared by uh, um, ATV users. So if you've got ATV in your area, check with them. Uh, it uses DHCP to go and sign the IP addresses. So I'll go and I'll go and set up the master as a certain address. In this case, 44102.4.2. I've got my gateway box set up as 4.1. That's okay. It's all hard coded. When this guy comes online, he's the client, he comes online, his Ethernet interface could be some IP address. He makes the connection over to the, to the uh, master, and the master says, oh, I'm gonna serve you up some uh, DHCP address, and it might be different. You can configure it that it doesn't move, but don't be surprised, you go and assign it an address, and it ends up changing as soon as you make a connection. Uh, the DHCP will overwrite your config. However, uh, it gets, but there's more. The actual IP address of this device is the same as this device, as is going to be the same IP address of the other six clients that connect to this master. They'll all assume the same IP address. Why? I'm not sure. But I'm going to guess this. Since they're not routers, uh, they have no routing capability in them. They're just translators from Ethernet to, to radio. I'm going to guess that they look like a piece of wire and you can't put multiple addresses on a piece of wire and say take it from this to this across this wire. So it just assigns them all the same. It's not a problem. They work. This box and that, is, uh, this box over here through this little network at 100 milliwatts is pinging this guy and it's just been chugging away the whole time we've been here. Some 4,300 pings. So really, really nice little unit. So a little bit more about it since we don't have a presentation coming in behind us. You can set them up as a point to multi point where you've got a master and you've got up to seven clients. The uh, author of this is working on uh, increasing that to 15 clients. The master, however, is not a router, so you want to put a router behind him so that uh, he's got some smarts. What I like them for is point to point. I want to go and link Monroe County with Washtenaw County. I can do it on 70 centimeters because in neither county do I have anything high enough to get a microwave link. Uh, there's some ridging in between us. Milan just got in the way. And the only thing high in the city of Milan is the water tower at the state prison. And that's just not available to us. 
So shooting a, a microwave link to Monroe is proven difficult, but shooting a 70 megahertz link might work fine. We'll give it a shot. This is off the NPR uh, website. You'll see that they've got uh, two hosts on, on one client, one host on one client. They each have their own IP addresses assigned to them, the radio network. By the way, your radio network, you end up setting a value as to what your network ID is, so you can have multiple networks. The master is sitting here, and he serves as the DHCP uh, server, and he also goes and sets the default route, and he's pointing the default route up to this router up here. So when this station here wants to connect with one of the guys here, this traffic comes in, goes to the router, bounces back out, and off it goes. So it's kind of like digital keeping, but a whole lot better. Um, I think there was something else I wanted to say about that slide. Let me catch up. Nope, I covered it all. Nothing more to know. Okay. So the next slide. You configure these. Simply hook them up and tell that to the address they default to. From the factory, they default 192.168.0.253. That tripped us up. We had a whole bunch of guys buy these. We got like 20 of these in our area. And uh, one guy came back and says, hey, let me save you all a lot, a lot of trouble getting these configured. Hook it up to your ethernet and then just tell that to this address. Boom. And it worked. So. You go into that one address, it uh, supports a few commands, things like display config, you have to spell it out, it doesn't parse it with shorter words, display config, and then there's save, and there's set parameter value for, for changing parameters. So you'll see here I set the radio network ID to four. Um, the radio starts up. Uh, when, uh, at power, when I power the radio up, it starts up immediately. You can set it that it will only establish a connection if there's traffic being passed. RF power level, I uh, set mine down to 100 milliwatts, uh, value 9, because I'm just testing from one end of the shack to the other, but I do use dummy loads regardless. Uh, the frequency defaults to 437.0. Uh, the call sign you have to fill in. I have one of them running as my call sign, the other one running as my wife's call sign. One of them is set as the master. Uh, when you set it to no, it's obviously a client. Uh, what else I want to point out here? You, uh, you also get to go into sign, uh, uh, select if you're going to run a, a, a DHCP pool where it's gonna begin and how big it's gonna be in this case. This one was set up to hand out 32 addresses. If you're gonna have a default route, set it to yes and give it the uh, default route address. And if you're gonna have a DNS somewhere on the net that you need to, your clients to be able to reach, you have to set that. So it's really, really straightforward. It's really simple. And then once you've made your changes, say, save. Oh, one thing. Modulation. Modulation set for 24. 24 is is a uh, it's not a 100 kilohertz wide cha RF channel. It's a megahertz wide channel. So you have to set that to 20. Uh, that'll bring you down to 100 kilohertz. 100 kilohertz will allow you about 56 kilobits per second throughput and not break the uh, the FCC's rules for bandwidth. So, uh, but you can go and set that to something much, much bigger and, and pump, uh, you know, 240K. Fred, did you test your super high speed? Yeah. You did? I knew you would. I did the same thing. Anyway. We so, run them at, that's where we run them at. You do? Yeah. Uh, what about the bandwidth limits? Pull a webcam up, it's an ATV link. Okay. That'd be one way around it, I suppose. Always have a picture. We have tower cameras at all of our sites. Pull up yeah. the image, it's an ATV link. Guess yeah. what? It's now considered to me as an ATV mode. Okay. 
if the guys are on ATV at 2 megahertz wide digital, why can't I run it a half that? 700 kilohertz. Valid, valid argument. There you go. <laughs> we, may, we may follow that. Uh, the five frequencies that the uh, Michigan Area Repeater Council uh, recognizes are listed here. 430.05.15.35.45. And as I said, NPR comes default to 437 hot. So you probably want to change that, pick frequency, make sure it's clear, and go for it. So, summarize or uh, closing things up here. Things that you can do to go and get packet going in your area. You want to be able to move some digital stuff. You don't want to do it on HF just to talk to the neighboring county. Um, so plan on including packet networking in your operation, in your county's operations plan. Once you've got something set up, of course, train for it so that you end up with a pool of, a pool of what? Trained and equipped operators. Uh, remember, you don't have to reach the state EOC all on your own. The networks are there to carry the traffic for you. Um, we've had people go and set up high-profile digipeters on 145.76. Well, you get a high-profile digipeter in Kent County, and you put another one over in, say, I don't know, Bay County, and the state EOC is in the middle, and you got some users going through those digipeters at the same time. What happens to the packets in the middle? They bang heads, and neither of those systems get through to the state EOC. It's a bad idea. High-profile digipeters cause a thing called hidden transmitter problems. We can talk about that offline. But most of all, build nodes, anything. BPQ nodes, hook in with MI7, put up JNOS nodes, put up a plain old TNC and leave it, you know, leave the digipeter function turned on. Anything is better than nothing. Uh, again, I'll point out Cantronics KPC3 Plus has a K node feature. You don't want that. You want the K net feature. You set two parameters, and I think it was like uh, node, uh, node name and node call. You set two parameters, reboot it, and it comes up, and now that node is a NetROM node. What does NetROM do when it finds another NetROM station? They discover one another, they exchange routing tables with one another, and they automatically route around outages. It's a great little protocol. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. You can get more on the uh, DRG website. Uh, there's a PDF for how to step-by-step, uh, -step, how to install JNOS on a Raspberry Pi. That also works if you're just installing it on a on a, a Linux PC with a few modifications, but you'll get the idea how to pull the files down, how to compile it, how to debug it. Usually the debugging just means you didn't pull down all the right files. Um, there are example uh, config files on the site. I'll get a, uh, I'll probably set up an AWS, a Google AWS server, so I've got high bandwidth for putting the, uh, the noobs JNOS image out on the, uh, out on the web. And uh, RCR years ago wrote a great little package uh, for uh, Fedora on a Raspberry Pi with JNOS built in. And his config tool was, uh, uh, was NCURSIS based. You got a form, you filled out the data, and, and you plugged in the right stuff, and it made up your config files for you. Or you can go in, you can use the best editor ever made called VI. Who still uses VI? I love it. Emacs. Oh no! Yeah. Use whatever you like. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for uh, for coming. Since there is nothing uh, coming in behind us here, um, you know we can play a little bit. Uh, I will apologize that these things were talking really, really, really fast at home. When I brought them here, the darn things are pinging at like half a second a ping. And I don't know quite why, so I need to go in and work that out. Next year, I want to show a hands here. Next year, instead of doing a, yet another update, Thank how would you guys feel about I come in and do a presentation on setting up solar on your home, a DIY kind of thing? Um, what I've done at my house is a couple of panels. Um, rewired the house for 12 volt wiring, LED lights. We run everything. We live on 12 volts DC. I think we're in a motorhome or something. But uh, the house runs on 12 volts DC to go and, and offset our uh, AC bill. But um, 
Uh, I've got a, a good presentation for, for that that we could do here next year. And the, the goal being by uh, running solar at your home during a wide scale uh, power outage, uh, what good are you in the amateur radio if you don't have power to ring your rig? Yeah, you got a nice beautiful home station, but you gotta go and pull your car up and throw a power cable through the window to keep it on the air. Um, not exactly a good solution. So next year I'd like to do something on, uh, on solar power uh, because you are of no use to MCOM unless you can keep it powered, keep yourself uh, warm, keep yourself fed, keep the water flowing, etc. So uh, next year, if we uh, come back here, I'd like to do something on solar power. Sound good? Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Half an hour.